maybe that's too much. There. There. <laughs> Good afternoon, friends. Good morning, friends, actually. Uh, I'm Dr. Ajay Shah, bringing you another great, great weekend live. And today I have a guest. She actually is my mentor. She is a best-selling author of many, many books. She's an international speaker. She is a consultant for many nutrition uh, programs. She herself is a vegan. And in my opinion, she is an encyclopedia of nutrition knowledge and many of the nutritional research studies. I watch many of her videos on YouTube. And like I said, I read many of her books, many of my talk, actually a lot of my material for my talks come from her talks. So she definitely is a very great place source for all of us to learn everything about nutrition, everything about staying healthy. So let's welcome that great guest, Brenda Davis. Welcome, Brenda. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. It's my pleasure and, and a great privilege to be with you. So thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you. So please tell us uh, for our viewers, many of our followers and viewers know you actually and they watch your videos, but for people who are just starting to know you, please tell us where you live and how long you've been a registered dietitian. Well, I've been a registered dietitian since 1983. So that's a lot of years, <laughs> getting close to 40. Um, and I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So I, uh, I just moved here about a year ago from the beautiful British Columbia, Kelowna, British Columbia, where I was for about 20 years before that. But I originally come from Northern Ontario. So, <laughs> so I've been uh, living in various places in Canada, all of which are quite wonderful. That's great. So let's start talking about nutrition now. Uh, first important question, we all need to know what we, what we eat as Americans, we call standard American diet. What are the plus minus of standard American diet and what has led to this obesity? Well, Dr. Shah, I think many people are probably well aware that, uh, you know, probably an estimated 70% or so of the North American population will die. And even the global population will die of a diet and lifestyle induced chronic disease. And, and these diseases are largely, uh, if not almost totally preventable. And, and this to me is a tragic, you know, just a tragedy of, of enormous proportions because it's so preventable. And so when we look at what is the problem with the diet, the problem really is that the, the form of the foods that we're eating um, we're eating the sort of the richest, most salt and sugar and fat laden foods that, that you know, are available to mankind. And if you think about um, what we're sort of naturally adapted to eat, uh, uh, whatever is, is available for us in our environment, uh, we, you know, we naturally are inclined to be drawn towards foods that are rich in fat and sugar and salt. Uh, and, and when we take these components, if, if you look at these, these components in nature, they're very dilute. And so you, you know, you're drawn to them, but you don't overeat them because they're so dilute in whole foods. But when you take these things and you concentrate them, and then you infuse them into the food system as we have done, as in fast foods and deep fried foods and highly processed foods, making everything so fast and easy and convenient. What happens is you overwhelm your appetite control center and, and you can no longer um, uh, accurately determine when you should stop eating uh, because you, you lose control over those senses. And so you end up overeating. And, and uh, you know, for many years on the planet, the number one form of malnutrition was um, hunger. Uh, and, and now the number one cause of malnutrition is overconsumption. And, uh, and overconsumption leading to these diseases of, of, you know, chronic diseases of, of nutrition aberration, really. And, and so what people need to understand a couple of things. One is that no doctor, no dietitian, no healthcare provider can eat for you. 
There is no healthcare provider that can exercise for you. Those are things that are completely within your control. You have the ability to change what you put in your mouth. And when you change what you put in your mouth, you change yourself because every single cell of the human body is a product of what goes in here. That's, that's, it's really the raw materials with which we build our brain cells, with which we build every cell in the human body. And so, of course, when we uh, change what we eat, we change how our body works and looks. And, uh, and it's absolutely unbelievable how fast that change start, starts to happen. And so although the diet that most North Americans uh, are, currently consume is um, replete with problems, uh, we, uh, we have the capacity to change that. And change starts with you. <laughs> it, it starts with one individual. And when you, you start demanding uh, different foods, of course, the industry will be providing foods you will buy. If you stop buying the foods, I mean, you're, you know, you vote with your dollar. If you say, I'm not going to purchase foods that, that will, you know, hasten my demise, uh, then other foods will become available that will be more health supportive. And I think we can do that as a culture. We can make the shift and we're seeing it now. We're actually seeing the availability of healthy food beginning to increase. Oh, no, that's an excellent answer. I agree. I think with the 42% obesity in America and rapidly becoming 50% in five to seven, 10 years, I think we definitely are not eating right. And I think many times, many people, you know, unfortunately, consciously, subconsciously are not even aware how rapidly they are becoming obese. I mean, compared to 1985, I mean, those numbers are exponentially growing. And like you said, I think that those changes, if somebody starts just eating healthy, and I'm talking about 80, 90% healthy, the response in terms of health is so rapid. I've seen so many of my patients, their blood sugar starts coming down within like few days, few weeks, and mm -hmm. they start getting off their insulin like in two to three weeks or one month. I mean, they are on insulin for 15, 20, 25 years, and they're getting off their insulin. So, so results are quick. Body is a, in a wonderful machine. I mean, it responds to everything we do, I mean, immediately. So I think exercise, sleep, it applies to everything. So that brings my next question. Yeah, just one second, I have to add to that comment because um, one of the things that I did in my career was in 2006 I went to the Marshall Islands to do a research study on diabetes and there they have the highest rates of diabetes on the planet and and I the thing that surprised me most was how rapidly people got well when they started to eat well and exercise I was shocked within a week like you say their numbers were normalizing, the, the pain in their joints was disappearing. They, they could walk further than they had been able to before. They, many of them said their, their brain fog just lifted. Uh, it, was, it was remarkable to me how fast that happened. I almost, I, I, I would have not believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, how rapidly those changes occur. And I think that can be so encouraging for people to know that it doesn't take very long to see change. Yeah, I think I listened to your talks about Marshall Islands and that's very commendable that you and your husband took like six months or longer to stay there. I mean, that's a, that's almost like joining an army to help people in the world. <laughs> I think that's very, very commendable and I'm very thankful for that. So let well, me ask thank a you. simple question. Um, a lot of us, many of our viewers, followers are actually, you know, vegetarian, vegan, a lot of people in India watching it. But at the same time, I'm realizing that, you know, being vegan is not necessarily being healthy. So please tell us you know, what it means to be vegan and what it means to be whole food, plant-based, and possibly without the oil. Yeah, so, so this is an important question. And I, I, uh, I think in India, people are, um, they, they have an advantage over people in North America. And that advantage is, is really that uh, so many of the healthy foods, especially legumes like lentils and chickpeas and 
all of these legumes, they actually know how to consume and make taste uh, fabulous. And so uh, many people in North America have no idea how to use legumes. So this is something we need to, you know, commend, uh, you know, we, we need to ad adopt from people in India is way learning ways of preparing these foods to make them delicious and healthful. Now to your question about vegan versus whole food plant-based, a vegan diet is a diet that eliminates animal products. So there's no meat, no fish, no, no chicken, no dairy products at all. Uh, so it, it's really a hundred percent plant-based diet. And it can be a whole food plant-based diet for vegans that choose to eat that way, or it can be a junk food diet for vegans that choose to eat that way. So a vegan diet can be loaded with potato chips and uh, cola and, and, and processed uh, foods, and it can still be vegan. Uh, so what distinguishes whole food plant-based from vegan is very simply that um, a whole food plant-based diet, while not always 100% vegan, is mo usually mostly vegan, but it's a, a healthy, the healthy vegan diet. And, uh, and then with the oils, some people eating mostly whole food plant-based will use small amounts of, of sugars, like a little bit of maple syrup, a small amounts of oils, like a little bit of sesame oil in a peanut sauce or a little bit of uh, salt as in, you know, tamari on, on some uh, food. Uh, but they, they, they minimize their intake of these things. And, and many people eating whole food plant-based, especially if they're fighting chronic disease, try to um, eliminate oil because it's the most concentrated source of calories in the diet. It's 120 calories in one tablespoon with very few nutrients. So the only nutrients you might find in oil might be vitamin E, a little bit of vitamin K, otherwise nothing. And so people we try to encourage to get their macronutrients, whether it's fat, whether it's protein, whether it's carbohydrate from whole foods, because when you get those macronutrients from whole foods, they come packaged naturally with fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants and plant enzymes that help convert phytochemicals to their active forms and sterols and stanols and, and all of these things that support a healthy gut microbiome and that, sub, that reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress and, and help you to be maximally healthy. So I think that's really key. No, I think I agree with you. And as I understand from the statistics that vegetarian and vegan in India actually are almost in a worse situation as much as meat eating people in America. And I think when we talk about the vegan in America, we're talking about, for example, Seven Day Adventists, their vegan diet is much more cleaner and much more healthier, you know, almost whole food plant based compared to the vegan and vegetarian diet in India. So I think uh, India is becoming a heart attack capital, diabetes capital. So mm -hmm. I think I agree with you. Being vegan or being vegetarian does not automatically make you a healthy diet person. So that brings, now I'm going to dive into you know, your brain, your expertise, because I listen to so many of your talk. So let's talk about how much vegetables, you know, in terms of cruciferous vegetables, other algae family vegetables, how much vegetables we should eat per day. As I understand, we should be eating, listen to your talk, that we should be eating at least a pound of raw, pound of uh, cooked vegetables, and then adding other things to make up for our caloric needs. And I listen to that elegant talk you gave about how much grain a person should have. So please expand into how much vegetables, how much uh, raw and cooked vegetables and what kind of family of vegetables we should eat. Yeah, so with vegetables, um, you're, you're really vegetables and fruits, really. You're wanting to aim for at least 10 servings a day. Uh, if you're, especially if you're trying to reverse disease. I myself probably eat 12 to 14 servings a day of vegetables and fruits. And what you want in those categories is you want foods that are, are minimally processed, of course, but you want to have variety. 
because in in variety you're when you eat a variety of foods you're maximizing your different types of phytochemicals you're maximizing the different types of fiber and the 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 different types of antioxidants to give you the greatest bang for your buck and so what i would recommend is at least three servings of green leafy vegetables a day and and um, so these can can be any type of leafy greens, but but my preference uh, is uh, for the the leafy greens that are a little bit lower in oxalic acid, and lower in oxalates because oxalates bind to minerals, especially calcium. And so when you're eating a whole food plant based diet, you want to be at uh, extracting uh, as much calcium as you can from the leafy greens. So for example, uh, it means um, kale and broccoli and turnip greens and mustard greens and Chinese greens. These greens are lower in ox oxalates. And so you're able to absorb more of the calcium as opposed to spinach or, or beet greens or Swiss chard, which are very high in oxalates and they're wonderful foods. They're great sources of folate but they're not such great sources of calcium because we are unable to extract the calcium from those foods. So leafy greens, wide variety, as dark as possible. So you want the dark green leafy as, as opposed to iceberg lettuce, for example. And then you go on to looking at all the other colors of the rainbow. And so I would say at least one red, uh, one orange, uh, you know, in that sort of uh, pink red category, at least one thing in the orange yellow category, at least one thing in the purple blue category, at least one. And then in the white and beige, uh, at least one garlic, onions, these kinds of foods. And, and then, you know, you can go from there. But one of the things that I try to do is when I make a salad, I try to have a, um, a number of, I made a salad for my mom and I last night and, and uh, brought it over to her place for dinner. And I had uh, greens from my garden, greens that I purchased at the farmer's market. And then I had three different sprouts that I had grown, sunflower sprouts and lentil sprouts and broccoli sprouts. Broccoli sprouts are one of the foods that are highest in sulforaphane, which is a very potent anti-carcinogen. So these cruciferous vegetables are extremely powerful uh, choices. And then I tried to have something of every color of the rainbow. And so we had red peppers and we had uh, orange and yellow carrots and, and I had purple cauliflower. And, and so we just, you know, I just try to do the, the whole, I had kohlrabi and, uh, and, and so that I find that that's a, a kind of a fun thing to do is to try to represent the rainbow in your salads and in your stir fries and foods like that. So uh, I mean, that's a great answer. I think, uh, and you explain in a very simple way, actually, a lot of people obviously, you know, want to keep their life simple when they eat. And I think explaining that just eat rainbow plant-based, whole food plant-based diet, and they typically will get. At the same time, I think it's important to know which green leafy vegetables to choose more and which to choose less and balance it, particularly for women when they're trying to get calcium. And as I understand, I think we should have a, like, I mean, there's a number now thrown that we should have a variety of about 30 different plants in our, uh, in our eating per week to help our microbiome. Like you said, different bacteria thrives into different kind of uh, uh, fiber-based food, plants and fruits and other things. So when we have variety, we have also diversity of uh, microbiome also. So just as we create diversity in our food, you know, microbiome diversity also happens. So I think I agree with you. So that brings my next question. A lot of people are afraid of eating grain and that's your specialty actually. I know the term hierarchy of grain has been actually given by you and everybody talks mm -hmm. about it. So please tell us, what is the hierarchy of grains? And also how much grain a person should have? Like if somebody is an athlete, obviously they need more calories. So your principle of having first all the vegetables and fruits we should have, then have the beans, and then whatever left for the caloric needs, add the grain, because like you always have explained, calorie, the grains are caloric dense food. So please tell us uh, about grains and hierarchy of grains and how much we should have. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, 
first of all, I, I want to say that, that there's a great controversy about grains in the world right now because we have these very low carb uh, advocates uh, that are very popular on the internet. And people have this idea that grains are, are harmful foods. And in fact, we've had a number of studies showing that not only are grains not unhealthy, but that they actually are quite protective when they're eaten in the whole form. So one of the problems we have with grains is probably 90% of them are eaten processed. And so that's the first thing to understand is when you take a food and you, you remove the outer layer, the bran, and you remove the germ where we store all of the nutrients, and, and then you add a bunch of fat and sugar and salt and color and flavor and, and uh, preservatives and everything else, and then you eat the grain, it's not going to be a healthy choice. Um, you can't remove everything of value, add a bunch of garbage to a food, eat it and think, oh, I'm eating a grain. So this is, you know, a, a good thing. Grains are healthy when they're eaten as nature intended, as, as they've been grown. And so I've, I, I've developed this thing called the whole grain hierarchy. And what it really is, is, is helping people to understand that even if you stick to only 100% whole grains, so that's all you eat, you eliminated refined grains, you eat no white flour products, you don't eat white rice, you're eating brown rice, you're eating you know, a whole wheat bread and, and brown rice cakes or whatever. Within that whole grain world, there is a hierarchy. So no refined grains, just whole grains. The whole grains, the hierarchy is about the level of processing. So if you take a grain and pick it off the plant and just remove the, the outer husk, for example, and that's all, you've got the intact whole grain, like for example, brown rice or black rice or red rice or quinoa or uh, oat groats or uh, kamut berries or spelt berries or wheat berries. These are intact grains and, and these grains have everything that nature intended for us to have. If you take and sprout the grains, you can further improve their value because you release the stored forms of nutrients and you increase the value of some of the, you know, the types of proteins and fats and, and, the, and the vitamin C and so forth. So that, but these intact grains, what we do is often we, the first level on the hierarchy after the intact whole grain would be a cut grain. And so you just cut it up and you make a uh, bulgur or, or cracked wheat or steel cut oats. The next would be a rolling the grain. So for example, rolled oats. And then the next would be um, uh, shredding the grain like shredded wheat. And then would be grinding the grain as in flour products. And below that would be flaking the grain as in a flaked cereal. And at the bottom of the whole grain hierarchy would be puffed grains, which are put under a lot of pressure and puffed like uh, brown rice cakes, for example, or uh, a puffed rice cereal or puffed wheat cereal. And as you go down that hierarchy, you are literally increasing the glycemic index of the food and you're increasing the rate at which that food will be absorbed into your bloodstream. Uh, and the other thing you're doing is as the processing increases, you're losing nutrients. So when you expose a food to 1500 pounds of pressure to puff it, uh, it destroys some nutrients. And so you want to stay as high on that whole grain hierarchy as you can. And I know for people in India, this is an issue because a lot of the grains that are consumed are white rice and a lot of roti and naan bread and, and a lot of them are made with, of course, flour and often refined flour. And also the sweet treats, there are a lot of sweets and again made with white flour and, uh, and concentrated starches. And so this is something that I think people um, are very challenged with because many people use 
more highly refined grains as opposed to intact grains. And that we can change. One of the things that I do, and just to share what, what I do in, for my breakfast, for example. So I will take an intact grain or two or three. I might use barley and oat groats and, and kamut berries. And I will cook those with lentils. And, and so then I've got a mix of these intact whole grains and lentils. And I use that as the base of my breakfast bowl. And then I add a lot of fruits and some nuts and seeds and maybe some cashew yogurt or, you know, something like that, uh, chia pudding to give it some creaminess. And then you can sprinkle on uh, cardamom and cinnamon and ginger and, you know, these kinds of nutmeg and these kinds of spices and, and some uh, plant milk on top. And it makes a lovely uh, breakfast and you're getting in the intact whole grains and some lentils, which are really high in fiber and nutrients like iron. And so it makes a wonderful uh, breakfast bowl. And then that same mixture, sometimes I'll sprinkle a little on my salad at lunchtime or use it as the base of a dinner bowl. But these are things you can experiment with. And so, and, but if you are using flour, you want to use the coarsest whole grain flour that you can use. Wow, excellent answer. And I think I actually advise and ask all of our viewers to watch and listen more on this hierarchy of grains, but you covered most of it today. So that's a great privilege. You know, I think uh, I, I'll give you my personal example. This puff grains, I think there's one we call in India called mumra. I don't know if you've heard about that term or not, but it's a puff white rice and it's very popular in my state. And I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor last year, just to see, I'm not diabetic, but just to see how my sugars fluctuate. And I had a ball of puff rice and my sugar spiked up like in 40 minutes to 210. It was essentially like drinking, all, uh, drinking a juice. I mean, it was essentially sugar coming rapidly to my blood. So I agree with you. I think one has to know what grains, grains are required. Grains are, you know, so, Grains are the one which gives you enough calories when you are active and you are busy and exercising and other things. So grains are required, but at the same time, choosing the right type of grain is very important. That brings my next question. And like you partly said, then in India, even many of the blue zones, this lentils and beans is a staple diet. And sometimes even it's thought that one of the important reasons they live up to 100 live healthy is partly because of the lentils and beans. So please tell us, how much lentils and beans we should have? And is this something uh, as American, we should be eating at least uh, once or twice a day? Oh, absolutely. I think legumes are sort of the most undervalued food we have. And in fact, there are some people that say, oh, they contain lectins. You shouldn't eat beans like the paleo people and, and uh, a lot of communities that are the low carb communities. And I think it's a huge mistake. There was actually a study done that, that looked specifically at people who were 70 years of age and over. And they found that legumes had the strongest predictive um, uh, association with uh, mortality and they decreased mortality. I think it was seven to 8% with every 20 grams of legumes consumed, 20 grams. That's like what, a tablespoon and a half? It's almost nothing. Imagine if people ate a whole cup. <laughs> it would, you know, it would in, it would reduce mortality 80 or 100 percent. It, it's there really are remarkable foods. And when you think about it, they're super low in fat, about 5 percent fat for many of them. Um, uh, um, our garbanzo or chickpeas are a little higher, about 13 percent. Soybeans are quite a bit higher. But of course, any fat in legumes is unsaturated. It's a very healthy fat. Uh, but generally, they're extremely low in fat. They're highest fiber foods we have on the planet. They have more fiber than any other foods, but they're also high in protein and iron and zinc and other trace minerals. So they have a lot to offer and they provide a lot of the nutrients that many Westerners and people all over the world now are using meat for like iron and zinc. So they provide those nutrients in a form that's so much safer than coming from animal products. And so these are really critical foods. And I would say 
uh, eat them at least, if you can, twice a day. Uh, that's ideal. Um, uh, certainly, even three times a day, I include uh, lentils in my breakfast. I include some sort of bean or even sometimes tofu on my lunch salad. And then my dinner meal is all, almost always uh, legumes are included. Uh, if I if legumes aren't included, we might have tofu. But three times a day is my standard for legumes. And uh, so at least twice a day, I would say is really optimal. Well, that's so important. As I understand, looking at the data that we are eating a lot less legumes, we eat like six pounds a year in America. I mean, that's oh, just terrible. Very, very, very bad statistics. And on the other hand, we eat about 250 pounds of meat every every year in America. So I think it should be other way around. I mean, uh, legumes should Absolutely. be the dominant source of our protein. And like you said, you know, the prebiotic is essentially means beans and legumes. I mean, all bacteria in our, our colon, our bowel, they thrive on this prebiotic. And when we provide this prebiotic, they produce this wonderful substances, including those small chain fatty acids, which has shown so many benefits. So I think I agree with you once or twice, even three times a day. I think uh, listening to you, I should start eating. I eat typically twice a day, but I think we should be start eating three times a day. That brings my next question. Many of the even whole food plant-based uh, giants sometimes recommend that nuts should be avoided if you have heart disease or nuts should be avoided if you are trying to lose weight. On the other hand, some giants like Dr. Furman, for example, uh, you know, recommends having one ounce of nuts every day. So what are your views on nuts and seeds? Well, I, I, you know, it's a really um, a challenging question, to be honest, because the studies on nuts and seeds uh, in terms of cardiovascular risk consistently show they reduce risk. So we see people that eat nuts and seeds and nuts particularly, uh, although I think seeds are even healthier than nuts, to be honest. They have uh, more protein, less fat, more trace minerals, uh, more essential fatty acids. So they're very, very valuable. But generally, we see some 30% or more risk reduction in cardiovascular disease with people that regularly consume nuts. And we saw this in the Adventist health studies. However, we also have uh, Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn who have shown tremendous success with using an extremely low fat diet that excludes nuts and seeds with the exception of a little bit of, of ground flaxseed or chia seed. Uh, and, and they get a tremendous uh, reversal of chronic disease. Now we've never done a trial where we take um, you know, the, the super low fat, no nuts and seeds uh, diet or very limited seeds diet with a diet that is also low in fat, but contains about an ounce of nuts or seeds. We don't have that research yet. And so we don't really truly know the answer. But my feeling is this, I think um, it, it, for people that are at risk for heart disease, I think they need to make sure they're getting essential fatty acids. And those come from uh, hemp seeds, uh, flax seed, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts. And, and aiming for about an ounce of those a day in the diet is very, very, a very reasonable choice. On the other hand, if you have severe cardiovascular disease and you really want to do an Esselstyn or an Ornish diet, I think you're justified in doing that, but just be sure to include at least enough seeds to get your essential fatty acid needs met. So that would mean you know, you want, um, you know, you want at least a, a, a tablespoon or two of, of ground flax, chia, hemp seeds, and that would be a reasonable compromise. Well, yeah, no, that's an excellent answer. I think in my own practice, if a person already has established uh, coronary disease or heart blockage, I actually, and if they're obese particularly, I ask them obviously to eliminate the oil. So a lot of the omega-6 goes away, uh, vegetable oils. And then I also ask them to avoid nuts until they're at ideal body weight and have two tablespoons of flax seeds. So I think I'm trying to like take all the good things from everything and create this balancing omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. 
because I think if uh, somebody eliminates oil like Chef AJ, she says that she does not need to take any omega-3 supplements because she gets enough omega-3 from her diet, from flax seeds and other things, and she does not take any oil. So her ratio is always in an external, external range. So I think it's elimination of vegetable oil and adding two, tables, two tablespoons of flax seeds probably will get you the best scenario. But I agree with you. The data is still not out and we will be still... That brings the next question, which is a kind of a broad question. So, you know, please be as inclusive as you can. And that's about diet and cancer. Obviously, you know, certain malignancies are clearly related to certain kind of food we eat. But at the same time, you know, when I was in medical school in India, I did not see as many different type of cancers, you know, as I see in America. I mean, so much a higher prevalence of certain malignancies in America. And partly, I think it's part of the processed meat, even just meat in general and dairy and breast cancer. So please be as descriptive in diet and cancer. Yeah, so, you know, we have such solid evidence for diet and, and diabetes, such solid evidence for diet and heart disease. Uh, and, and we are getting more and more solid evidence for diet and cancer. Uh, but we have less with, with diet and treatment of cancer than diet and development of cancer. And so we, you know, some of the most comprehensive uh, reports oh, that we have are from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute of Cancer Research. And the guidelines for preventing cancer are really very clear. Uh, we know that processed meat is a group one human carcinogen. We know that red meat is a group 2A, I believe, human carcinogen, which is a probable carcinogen. And, and so we, the problem with red and processed meats are that they're, that, well, there are a number of problems. There, there's no fiber, there's no phytochemicals. There are a, a number of components that enhance the, the uh, establishment of cancer. Uh, even heme iron can be a pro-oxidant, so can increase oxidative stress. Uh, we've got, you know, TMAO and endotoxins and new 5 gc which is a pro-inflammatory molecule. The list goes on and on. And then many of the animals that we eat, very different than wild animals that were eaten in, you know, the latter Paleolithic uh, period. They're, um, you know, 40 to 60 percent of calories from, from fat or more in some cases. They, uh, so they're very high in fat. They're, they're often, uh, you know, um, high in, in, in environmental chemicals, uh, like the, the chemicals that move up the food chain. They, they are often, these animals are treated with hormones and antibiotics. And so these are foods that we know to be associated with increased risk of cancer. Uh, dairy products are, are you know, uh, a, a little less um, defined in terms of their association with cancer, but we do know that dairy does tend to increase risk of prostate cancer in men and possibly ovarian uh, cancer in women. Uh, less evidence for breast cancer, but there is some association there as well. Uh, so generally, animal products are, are not very, you know, are, are um, things that we should be minimizing if we're trying to reduce cancer risk. On, on the other hand, uh, the evidence for plant foods uh, preventing cancer is just overwhelming. Uh, we know that intake of vegetables and fruits, intake of whole grains, intake of legumes tends to reduce uh, overall cancer risk. And it, this is clearly reflected in rates of cancer among people eating plant-based diets and not even whole food plant-based diets, just eating Plant-based diets like in Epic Oxford and in the Adventist Health Study too, if we look at the association uh, comparing healthy omnivores with healthy vegans or vegetarians, we see a reduced risk of, of a number of types of cancer in the, in the plant-based populations. And they aren't even eating perfect plant-based, they're just eating plant-based. And there was a study in Taiwan showing a 58% risk reduction in breast cancer for women who were, you know, health conscious vegetarians versus health conscious omnivores. And, and so the evidence is really uh, rapidly uh, uh, expanding. And we know that uh, whole plant-based foods are the most powerful protectors against multiple types of cancers, not just the cancers we might expect to be linked to, um, to diet, but many, many types of cancers. 
Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think uh, also, you know, learning more and more that obesity is actually one of the biggest uh, risk factors for cancer. And all the calorie dense food we get from animal products and all the saturated fat, I think saturated fat is also an independent predictor of uh, cancer. And I think processed food with a lot of ca high calorie density, like I said, no fiber. So I think obesity itself, you know, I think to me is a major reason a lot of Americans are getting cancer. Uh, I, I agree with you completely. Obesity is, there are a couple of things that are very strongly associated with cancer. One is obesity and the other is alcohol consumption. And so there, there is no safe intake of alcohol uh, that doesn't increase your risk of, uh, you know, or no amount of alcohol that doesn't increase your risk of cancer. Even fairly small intakes will increase your risk of cancer. Uh, alcohol eases uh, carcinogens into cells. And, uh, and so we need to be aware of both of those things, obesity and alcohol as part of the picture. Well, thank you, yes. So that's a, that's a next question now that uh, there are a lot of, uh, lot of reports now about this uh, uh, different type of fruit juices or juice, energy drinks, you know, even sugar in general. I remember growing up uh, when I came to America, even in my twenties, that orange juice was like a staple thing every morning before I went for work or internship, you know, I was drinking a glass of orange juice. And now we are saying that that's probably as bad as drinking a Coke or Pepsi. So please give us your views on different uh, sodas and juice and energy drinks and just sugar in general. Yeah, well, in, in my opinion, I, I don't look at sugar as a poison, nor do I look at oil as a poison, but it, you know, it's really the, uh, the quantity that makes the poison. And so it's, it's, you know, sugar is naturally present in foods, but when you eat sugar, you want it to be in a whole food, like a fruit that's packaged with the fiber and the phytochemicals. So it takes the body time to break down the foods and the sugars are absorbed slowly. When you take sugar and concentrate it and then just drink it in a beverage, uh, when you drink calories, you don't register in your appetite control center that you've consumed the number of calories you have. So it doesn't, it's not very filling, it's absorbed quickly and it gets into your bloodstream quickly. And, and so my feeling is uh, we should absolutely minimize our intake of simple sugars and we should never consume simple sugars in liquid form ever. So no sodas, no energy drinks, none of that stuff. I shouldn't say never, there's one exception. And that exception is if you're an athlete who is running uh, you know, a marathon, uh, you need to get in some very quickly, rapidly burnable fuel. And so in that case, a sports drink could be very, very valuable. But for the average person, especially the average overweight person, you should not be drinking sugar ever. Uh, not putting it in your coffee or tea, I, I just wouldn't use it at all. Uh, and and uh, But if you have a tiny bit of maple syrup or blackstrap molasses or something like that in a, you know, a muffin or, or something you're making, uh, that is less harmful because you've got some fiber there and you've got some other things that will slow the absorption of that sugar. My preference personally is to use whole foods as my sugars. So dates or, or dried pears or, or something like that to give sweetness to those kinds of foods. That's ideal because those sugars, again, have the fiber with them. But in terms of, um, you know, just uh, uh, reducing our intake of sugars, uh, we, you know, the World Health Organization suggests ideally uh, that we shouldn't be consuming more than, I mean, they say maximum 10% of calories from added sugars, but 5% being preferable. Well, 5% is six teaspoons. You get six teaspoons in four ounces of soda. You get six teaspoons in a half of a cinnamon bun. You get six teaspoons often in a half a cup of fruit flavored yogurt. I mean, our food is just laced with sugar and we need to learn to read labels. If a label says four, grams of sugar, that's about a teaspoon. And so if you see 40 grams of sugar, you know you're getting 10 teaspoons of sugar. It's too much. 
Children under the age of two should get none, no added sugars at all. And above two, it should be no more than six teaspoons a day and preferably as little as possible. So I myself use almost no sugar in my food preparation at all. Uh, because I just, we, we get carbohydrates from whole foods. That's where they need to come from. Well, I agree with you. I think uh, there were two Facebook questions came. Uh, one was about how about some of the sugar substitutes like uh, uh, Splenda, and then some people asked that uh, how about the stevia as the closest one to the natural sugar. So, what are your views on that? Yeah. So my views on that are are that number one, don't use artificial sweeteners. They're they're you know, like Splenda is a trichlorinated sugar that your body doesn't recognize as sugar on its way through, it can actually damage your gut microbiota. And, and so these artificial sweeteners that affect your gut microbiota, then they affect your production of short chain fatty acids, They product, which, which then affects your inflammation. You end up with low grade inflammation. Obesity produces low grade inflammation. And what we know about these sweeteners is they do not they do not decrease risk of obesity. They, you know, a lot of people who, you know, they're eating their McDonald's hamburgers and French fries and drinking their, their diet soda, thinking that they're justified in eating more calories. And, and this is not a good plan. Just drink water, <laughs> please. And if you must flavor your water, uh, the one thing that I once, once in a while will do, especially with company, is I will take a really high quality fruit juice like pomegranate juice or blueberry juice and freeze it in ice cube trays and put one ice cube juice, uh, one juice ice cube into the sparkling water. And then the color comes down and it gives a lovely flavor and it's pretty and you're getting mostly, you know, soda water. Uh, and so that's something people can do, but you really want to, you know, stop drinking sugar. And, and so that brings me to the question of the juice, the fruit juice. And, and again, if you're buying commercial fruit juice and, and drinking it down, you're removing the fiber from the fruit. You're still getting some value. There's no question. You are better off drinking a small glass of orange juice than a soda because the orange juice provides vitamin C, which will help you absorb the iron in your beans, for example, or whatever you're eating at breakfast. You'll, you'll get vitamin C, you'll get some bioflavonoids, you'll get some phytochemicals, but you're much better off eating the whole orange because you've got fiber and you've got more of the phytochemicals. You lose less. If you absolutely must uh, drink a juice, take a fruit and squeeze it and eat all of the fiber and squeeze it completely and have that as a treat after a long run or something like that. But it's not something you should be doing on a regular basis. If you're going to drink juices, the safest juices to drink are green juices. So you've juiced some kale and, and a carrot and, and some celery and cucumber, and you've added a little bit of lime and some ginger and some turmeric, or you know that kind of juice can boost your antioxidant status. But apart from that, you don't wanna be slugging back fruit juices because it's just a lot of sugar into your bloodstream too quickly. Eat the whole fruit. Wow. Again, Facebook is just lighting up. Uh, there was another question about this, uh, and we are on the subject, so I'm going to ask you about the monk fruit and also the role of uh, fruit smoothies. I know you said don't yes. drink the sugar, but a lot of people are in fashion now to have fruit smoothies. I personally believe that green smoothies probably are okay, but fruit smoothies, better you will just eat the whole fruit instead of the smoothies. And if you take the smoothie, take your time drinking because, uh, you know, fruit, it will take five, 10, 15 minutes, but smoothie, you can gouge in like five minutes or three minutes. So again, yes. you drink smoothie is also very important. What okay. are you Yes, yeah, so, so two questions here. One is the monk fruit and the stevia. So these are more natural sweeteners. And, and they're, if you are going to use a sweetener, they are your best choice, no question. However, what you need to realize is that if you're using these sweeteners, you're keeping your palate elevated in terms of 
what your preference for sweetness is. And to me, it's better to, to get your palate adjusted to less sweet foods. So for example, myself, I love to have um, ice cream made with um, frozen banana, frozen mango, frozen pineapple, something like that is a, a sweet treat in the in the summertime. All it is is frozen fruit put through a, a juicer or something. If I taste like a cashew ice cream or a, you know these vegan ice creams with a lot of sugar added, it's too sweet for my palate. I don't really enjoy it the way I enjoy the frozen fruit ice cream. And so your palate adjusts very, very quickly to sweetness. So I would say use the least amount of added sweetener that you can possibly use and, and, and try to decrease, decrease, decrease. Uh, and, and then the question about the smoothies, I, um, I think our, our views, Dr. Shaw, are very, very uh, similar on this. So I think that smoothies can be a reasonable choice, especially for people who need to get in extra calories. So for people trying to lose weight, the, it's again, you're drinking and, and it's less satiating than eating and chewing these whole foods. And it feels like you're eating less than what you actually are because you can get a lot into a smoothie. But if you're a person who is um, an athlete or you're underweight or you don't have time to eat breakfast or you're, you know, you're just in a rush, uh, these um, smoothies can be a meal replacement quite easily or can be um, something to add weight to somebody who's underweight or an athlete who needs more calories. But the thing that I would say with smoothies is I'm going to tell you, my husband loves green smoothies because he doesn't care to eat that much. So he'll eat breakfast, he'll eat supper, and he'll have a smoothie in between because he can't be bothered to eat lunch. So I'll tell you what I put in his smoothie. And to me, this is kind of the ultimate smoothie. So I put in, uh, I have a large uh, Vitamix container and I put in three quarters of the Vitamix dark leafy greens, kale, uh, greens from my garden, a bit of romaine lettuce and, and, and then some um, sunflower sprouts. I'm often sprouting, so I'll put sunflower sprouts. And, and that's three quarters of the blender. And then I put in a carrot, I put in a chunk of cucumber, I put in a piece of celery, I put in um, a, a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these green chickpeas, like they're fresh chickpeas, fresh frozen peas, so like uh, green peas, maybe a little soft tofu, some hemp seeds. I want the protein and the vitamins and minerals in that smoothie. So I use these things for the protein sources in the smoothie. And then, and I use quite a lot of hemp seeds. Hemp seeds have a wonderful uh, ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 and they're really high in protein and minerals. And so those will go in, they don't make the smoothie gluey like chia seeds and flax seeds do. So if you put chia and flax right away, your smoothie turns into glue and it's, it's hard for people to get down. Hemp seeds don't do that. And then um, I, I put in a little bit of fruit for palatability. So it might be a, a little bit of frozen banana or a little bit of frozen pineapple or an app, a small apple, something like that to give a little bit of uh, sweetness. And, and it's a big container to the top and I fill three glass containers. They go into the fridge and, and, uh, and that's the, the, the smoothie. And to me, that's a really healthy smoothie. And also all of those vegetables in there are blended. So they're gonna get absorbed into the bloodstream. And he just eat, uh, almost eats them slowly. So drinks them slowly. And, uh, and I think that's a reasonable smoothie. I think that's a, that's a smoothie. <laughs> you know, my wife has this cooking show also on our page. So I'm going to ask her, I'm going to make it with her, actually. We're going to make okay. exactly the smoothie you described so all of our viewers can have the same feeling. So thanks for describing that. And I think your husband is a lucky husband. So I think uh, all the nutrition knowledge and uh, you know, convenience of uh, you know, having the smoothie. So that brings our next question, which is from the Facebook also. And I think that's a very timely question also. A lot of this uh, meat substitutes are becoming very popular. 
I personally believe that that's a transition food, that if you are a meat-eating person, maybe you can go to Beyond Meat or other meat substitutes, but eventually the goal is to not stop there, but get to the whole food, plant-based, you know, beans and lentils-based uh, uh, homemade burgers. So what are your views on this meat substitutes? Well, to be honest, um, my views are, I welcome any, anything that will replace meat. Uh, and, and I hope that, that they'll just get healthier and healthier. But to me, um, you know, it's better for the planet. It's better for the animals. And it's actually better for us, too. If you compare a Beyond Meat Burger with a meat burger, you don't get the TMAO production. You don't get the, the inflammatory new 5GC. You don't get the cholesterol. You don't get, you know, a lot of the, the endotoxins, for example. So it's still a better choice. And I completely agree with you. It's, it's more of a transition food, but it can also be a food that allows um, for once in a while, a little greater variety in the diet. So I'll give you an example. We had my, uh, my daughter's uh, husband is from Bulgaria and his parents were visiting and their mainstays of their diet are meat and cheese. And a lot of it's processed meat and cheese. And uh, they, you know, don't eat a lot of beans and so, so forth. And we had them over for dinner and I, I bought uh, some of these Beyond Beef sausages. And so I made the Beyond Beef, I bought some healthier sausages as well and made some homemade beet burgers as well. So people could try different things, but they, I don't, they can't speak English at all. I don't think they knew that they weren't eating meat. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are times when it can be really handy <laughs> and, 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 you know, sometimes you're sending your child off to camp, to scout camp or whatever, and everybody's roasting wieners and it's really handy for them to have a tofu wiener that they can roast too. And so I think there's a place in the, in the diet that allows for these things that there are times when they can be so handy and, 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 but I don't think they should be mainstays of the diet. It's more an occasional treat or a transition food as you, as you mentioned. And so use them, they are high, high in fat, they're high in salt, they're, they're not ideal health foods. You're better off with lentils and beans, of course, but I do believe they are, they have a place. And I do believe that that uh, they are a gift to the world in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, saving uh, animals. Well, I agree, I think excellent answer. So next question, again, another popular question is about the coffee. Obviously coffee with uh, diabetes and liver cancer, Parkinson's disease, and at the same time, in terms of side effect, hypertension, osteoporosis, and many other issues. So what are your views on coffee in terms of pros and cons and how much coffee is a safe amount of coffee? Yeah, well, I think you summed it up, <laughs> the pros and cons there so well. Uh, we know that there's some associations with benefits in terms of Parkinson's and reducing risk of diabetes and such. If we're talking about coffee, now one of the problems with coffee, and remember coffee, coffee beans that are blackened. So when you blacken any food, you're getting products of oxidation form. So you get acrylamide, you get, you get these compounds that aren't so healthy, but it's also a bean. So there are some, you know, antioxidants present as well. And so there's, you know, and there's caffeine, which, which we know can be associated with, with some problems, especially for for, for people who you know, have issues with, uh, with addictions and so forth, and even uh, uh, with blood pressure and so forth. So I think you summed up the, the pros and cons really well. My um, feeling is that if you drink coffee, it should be not more than one or two cups a day, and it should not have, have added um, cream and sugar and all of these things. It, it ideally would be black. And I have to full disclosure here, I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. Uh, so I don't get the uh, attraction to it. I tasted it when I was 11 years old and I thought it was absolutely the worst tasting food I had ever tasted. And I thought there is no way nobody's ever going to convince me to taste that stuff again. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I don't I have an appreciation for, you know, all of the fancy coffees that people love, but just be aware 
that some of these fancy coffees, I was looking up, you know, just to see exactly what was in. One of these grand, you know, great big fancy maca, lata, whatever you call them, was 18 teaspoons of sugar. I was just stunned. Uh, so they, it, you know, they vary from about eight to 18 teaspoons in a large uh, fancy coffee. So they're, it's like drinking a thick milkshake. Uh, so be very, very careful with that. So if you drink it, uh, keep it as little as possible and certainly uh, don't overdo it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, uh, so again, Facebook is lighting up a lot of questions. There was another popular question, particularly from uh, the women the audience, uh, is about the role of uh, soy milk and soy in general and breast cancer and some other concerns, uh, which I personally believe that that's already been debunked. And I think soy milk actually is good for you, even maybe lowering the risk of breast cancer. So you are the expert, so please tell us about it. Well, you know, it, it, I find it really disturbing <laughs> that soy has, has received such negative, uh, you know, um, press uh, in, in social media for so long, because just think about this. I think this is the acid test. We have five blue zones. These are the people that live the longest, healthiest lives of any populations on the planet. Two out of those five blue zones consume soy on a daily basis. Uh, if soy was the poison that people are making it out to be, it, um, it would probably not be a staple food in two out of five blue zones. Uh, so I think just remember that. And then I can say without any shadow of a doubt, the evidence is in where, where, where soy and, and cancer is concerned, where soy and heart disease is concerned, where soy and kidney function is concerned. Soy beans reduce risk. And, and it, you know, where breast cancer is concerned, um, if you look at the populations that are the sort of greatest soy consumers, they actually have among the lowest risks of breast cancer on the planet. And in fact, in the Taiwanese health study, they found um, that soy consumers had, I think it was a 62% risk reduction in, in breast cancer risk. There, there are many, many studies that have shown that, that if we consume soy as children and adolescents, it reduces lifetime breast cancer risk. If we consume it as adults, it can reduce risk depending on the population. It seems to have a greater potential in Asian populations than in North American populations. And I wonder if it has anything to do with the form of soy we're consuming because a lot of our soy is highly processed and a lot of the isoflavones are removed. So what you need to know about soy is soy is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And that means it's a, what we call a serum. And, and what that means is, is it actually acts as a weak estrogen in some tissues or an, an anti-estrogen in some tissues, depending on the, on the receptor site. In breast tissue, it seems to act more as an anti-estrogen. So it actually keeps that, that harmful estradiol that can actually increase cell proliferation off the sites. And so it acts as a, a you know, it, it is actually protective against breast cancer. Not only is it protective against breast cancer, it reduces your risk of recurrence if you've had breast cancer, and if you're being treated for breast cancer, it reduces your risk of, of dying from breast cancer. So it, it you know, and, and, and so the thing that I would want to say about soy is, is I always choose organic when I'm choosing soy to avoid the pesticides and, and all of that. Um, and I also try to stick mainly to uh, less processed soy foods like uh, soy milk. So organic, unsweetened soy milk. Um, tofu, tempeh, uh, edamame, um, you know, uh, these are foods that are less processed soy foods, as opposed to soy cheese or, or the soy um, uh, burgers, which can be fine if they're, especially if they're organic, but I would, you know, have less of those and more of the tofu and tempeh and so forth. Well, wow, that's an excellent answer. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh... Uh, the next question again on the from the Facebook is that the role of uh, eating eggs. I know some people say that we should be eating one or two eggs every week. You know, a lot of different quote unquote benefits. I personally disagree with it, but obviously you are the expert. So what about eggs? 
Well, we don't need to eat eggs. Uh, um, eggs are, you know, certainly a, so a huge source of cholesterol, probably the most concentrated source of cholesterol in the diet. Uh, they contain some choline, they contain some essential fatty acids, they even contain some uh, DHA, which it can potentially be, you know, uh, helpful uh, for some people. But generally, uh, we don't need to eat eggs. And in fact, Egg consumption has been associated with increased blood cholesterol levels, increased oxidative stress, especially if, um, or, or increased oxidized cholesterol, especially if you're frying the eggs and so forth. And uh, they have been uh, strongly associated with increased risk of diabetes. And so I think there's enough evidence to say that, um, you know, eggs are not necessary and, and they're not a health food. Uh, you are better off getting your, you know, uh, tofu and making a tofu scramble or something like that to replace your eggs. Yeah, I agree. Now that brings uh, another important question. Obviously, diabetes, heart disease, you know, very prevalent, you know, number one killer heart disease. And I've, I've listened to you many of your talks. And please tell us just very briefly, in terms of uh, in terms of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, even for that say cancer, and you always have taught us that for all those conditions, the diet is essentially the same diet, which is the whole food, plant based, no oil diet. So please tell us how can a person can prevent and reverse many many of these chronic diseases? Just one simple one simple diet. They don't have to have diet for diabetes. They don't have to diet for heart disease. It's all the same diet. So please elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I love that you said that, and this is so true. And and we've we've learned this over and over and over again. It all boils down to this. It's simple. Uh, there are certain components of the diet that increase risk of disease that are uh, what you might call pathogenic or harmful. And there are certain components that are really healthful and that actually reduce risk of disease, like the fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants and sterols and stanols and so, so forth. And, and what plant foods do is they, they minimize the consumption of all of those components that are associated with increased risk of disease. And they maximize your intake of the, of the components that are associated with reduced risk of disease. So this is where your, this is, plant foods are where the fiber is concentrated, the phytochemicals uh, are concentrated, the antioxidants, all the anti-inflammatory compounds, uh, the, the plant sterols and stanols, all of these things that are protective uh, to health. And, uh, and so it's really very simple. It, it's no, you know, it, it's no um, uh, rocket science here. It's just simple common sense. If you're eating whole plant foods, you are eating fiber and, and, and all of these protective components. And so you want your plant foods in the least processed form possible. You want your diet to be vegetables, fruits, whole intact, mainly whole grains, legumes, a few nuts and seeds uh, and for essential fats and trace minerals. And that's the core of it, the healthiest, the diets of the healthiest people on the planet. The blue zones, for example, being, you know, 95% plant-based and, uh, and that's the key. And I think I, we can do even better than the blue zones, in my opinion. So I think that's, that's key. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think uh, with the, all the medical advancement, all the acute hospital care, all the prevention of accidents and other things we have, and if we add all the qualities of the nine characteristics of the blue zone, we should be living 120, 130, because uh, right. if they could do up to 100 with a lot of the things, you know, they, they did not have the same 911 or did not have the poison center or CDC. I mean, they still live up to 100. So I think we should be doing a lot better than with all this advance. Actually, we are going in the reverse direction. We are living less for the last three years. So I think uh, that's pretty, pretty tragic situation. Let me ask you one question and then we'll talk about uh, your work. My last question to you, because we have a lot of physicians who are our viewers, who are our followers, and many physicians are always asking me that, what are some of the top studies one should know about nutrition? 
And you are truly an encyclopedia for all the studies ever done on nutrition, both in terms of the in terms of the positive studies and negative studies. So, what are your top five studies every healthcare provider should know? Well, I would say really look at the studies that have been done that compare similar health conscious uh, uh, populations that differ in their dietary intake. And so the Adventist Health Study too is hugely important because we're, we're looking over time at what happens to people eating different diets, but living similar healthy lifestyles. They exercise the same amount, they drink the same amount, they smoke the same amount. And, and so these are very, very interesting comparisons. So the Adventist Health Study too, uh, Epic Oxford is a, another one uh, which does the same thing. Uh, the Taiwanese Health Study that compares the Buddhists who are omnivores versus the Buddhists who are vegetarians is another a series of very, very important studies. I think Dr. Dean Ornish's work is, is uh, really, really important. Uh, he has... Um, done work with heart disease and, and done a lot of work with uh, prostate cancer as well. And these studies not only show that, that when you eat a healthy plant-based diet, not only do you re reduce risk of chronic disease, but you actually change your genes, you change your genetic expression. And so you shut down genes that promote disease, you turn on genes that, that prevent disease. And so I think his studies are really very, very um, uh, classic and Im Im important uh, studies. And, and then I think the work, um, you know, some of the work that Neil Barnard's group is doing uh, to look at, um, you know, diabetes in vegans versus non-vegans. And, and um, he has a, a very, very excellent research team. And right now I was actually just part of a group of uh, his group. We just finished writing um, a, a paper on the ketogenic diet uh, to debunk a lot of the claims that are made about that diet. And so I think the, the research coming out of there as well. Oh, that's, that's excellent. I think those all studies are very important. People should look up, but you actually summarize them, give the names. Uh, so let's go talk about your work now. I think you wrote one of the earliest vegan book, uh, Eating uh, Being Vegan. I think, please, I think it was more than 25 years ago, as I understand. You look great. You don't look like an author who wrote a book that many years ago. Uh, so before I talk about your work, let me also tell our viewers and audience that if you have not watched Brenda Davis' six or seven minute long video on her yoga, on her stretches, the way she is so flexible, please, please watch that video. And then you will know what is the power of whole food plant-based person. I know Brenda's age, she can share with us. She looks great. I mean, she absolutely looks great. So every woman, if they want to look and feel like Brenda, please, please follow her work. So let's talk about your book. So please tell us what books you have written so far, and then tell us about your upcoming book with Dr. Shah. Okay, well, I'll tell you, I'm 61 years old. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I say this often, but I, I credit my diet for allowing me to feel at 61, not much different than I felt at 31. <laughs> so I, I, I still, I, I'm still as fit, I, I believe I'm as strong, I'm as flexible. And, uh, and that's why I did that little video demonstration because so many people think, well, after uh, 30 plus years of being vegan uh, that I, I wouldn't have the muscle anymore. <laughs> It wouldn't be, uh, you know, fast and, and so forth. So I wanted to debunk that. Uh, I've written 12 books. Um, the first book I wrote, it was a book called Becoming Vegetarian, and that was back in 1994. And, uh, and then I went on to write uh, Becoming Vegan, and, and then my co-author and I uh, rewrote. We did uh, completely new books of Becoming Vegan Express Edition and Comprehensive Edition, I wrote uh, Defeating Diabetes in 2003, and, and uh, I've since written two new books on diabetes. One is called Kick Diabetes Essentials, and the other is called The Kick Diabetes Cookbook. 
And so those two books, I think, go through a lot of the materials people need to have at their fingertips if they want to reverse disease. And the recipes were very thoroughly tested and actually really quite delicious. Many of the recipes in those books are just my staple recipes that I use all the time. Uh, and then the last book uh, that will be coming out in November, it's already gone to press, uh, is called Nourish. And uh, it's the definitive guide, uh, plant-based um, guide for families. And so this book is really geared towards uh, parents with children and all of the concerns you might have as a parent who wants to have a plant-based family. And I wrote this with Dr. Reshma Shaw. She shares the same last name as you, Dr. Shaw. And she's a pediatrician from San Francisco. And she is uh, very, very gifted. She's brilliant. Uh, she's super knowledgeable and very, very balanced in her thinking. So it was uh, quite a privilege to work with her on this book. She's also a very good writer. So we had a wonderful working relationship and we're very excited about the, the book. It'll be launched November 17th. Wow, so it's again, all, the book, yeah, the book and it's already, nice. yeah, sorry, it's already available for pre-sale on uh, Amazon. So that's, yeah. So definitely book nourish. I'm going to get it for sure. I have all your books. So if our Thank followers you. and viewers want to get one book today from Amazon, which would be your top book for just general healthy eating? Uh, I, you know, to be honest, this is going to sound strange. I mean, because it, it depends on what you want. I, uh, one of two, uh, uh, Kick Diabetes Essentials chronicles all of the associations between diet and, and lifestyle and, and, and takes you step by step through creating a healthy diet. Even if you're not diabetic, the, the guidelines in this book are of value for anyone wanting to reduce a risk of disease. Becoming vegan, either the comprehensive or the express editions, are for people who are vegan and want to make sure that all their I's are dotted and their T's are crossed. You have a question about iodine or vitamin D or, or omega-3 fatty acids. There are sections in the book that go through every detail. And we walk you through, uh, you know, um, uh, from infancy to senior years, underweight, overweight, eating disorders, everything is there uh, for fine tuning a plant-based diet. I think if I, if I have to buy one book after reading all your books, Becoming Vegan Comprehensive Addition is probably the Bible if you wanna go for food plant-based. Extremely, extremely important book. Everybody should own it. I oh, also ask you. all of our viewers, followers to watch tons of YouTube videos, tons of YouTube videos, you know, a lot of blogs, a lot of articles. And I think we should, I just read two, uh, two comments. One is a Melissa Canavay syndrome and she knows you, you know her, I think. She wrote, Brenda Davis is the best. And my wife wrote right oh. after that, agree, <laughs> agree she is the best and I agree she is the best. So oh, you, you are a mentor, you. our guide and we all just love you. So again, thank you, Brenda, for coming on. We are bringing you once or twice a year with all the updates on healthy nutrition, healthy eating, and wish you the best with your upcoming book. I'm buying it. A lot of people will be buying it. So again, keep doing the great work and thank you very much for spending your Sunday morning with us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really an honor and a privilege and, and I look forward to coming again and I hope everybody learned a little something new. Yeah. Let me stop the Facebook.